This Apple M1 MacBook Air deserves more praise than ever, especially after the pricing for MacBooks with M1 Pro and M1 Max have been released. It is as if Apple made this M1 MacBook Air and made a mistake of not pricing it correctly for the very first time. For the last one year, I have been using this M1 MacBook Air for everything that I do, including the videos on this channel since last few months. And this is my one year review of this particular laptop, which can help you decide if you were planning to buy this laptop, including which users should buy this laptop and which ones should actually stay away from it. As always, there are chapters in the video and if you wish to see a certain part directly for your purchase decision, then dive into that particular part directly. Let us first talk about the build. It is possibly the thinnest laptop that I have ever seen or used. It is just 1.16 cm in thickness. To give you a context here, here is my finger. It is super easy to slide in in any cover or bag. Even after being so thin, the durability of the structure and the rigidity is extremely strong. Something which Apple is known for since the first aluminium MacBook Pro in 2006. This features the same edge opening and comes with instant on display. Even being this thin, I have never found it wobbly or pulling the keyboard structure. This must be due to the extremely well calibrated hinge design on this particular laptop. MacBook Air comes with no fans inside. And hence, in my view, this is the most durable product that Apple has ever made. As there are no moving parts in it, lesser inflow of dust and lesser chances of something breaking down. Although this is a 13 inch laptop, the hand resting space, trackpad and the keyboard is large enough for you to work for long hours and does not really feel constrained. The keyboard is made of scissor mechanism keys and feels very much like the keyboard from my MacBook Pro Retina from 2013. Typing on this keyboard sounds very satisfying and you can work on for this for hours together. For switching the backlight for this integrated keyboard, you need to access the control center and turn up the feature from there. This is different from the previous MacBooks where there was a dedicated key for this. The keyboard comes with a dedicated button for Touch ID, which is equally as reliable on iPhones for unlocking your MacBook, making payments and app installation authorizations. Talking about the screen, it is a 13.3 inch display with a 16 by 10 aspect ratio with 2560 by 1600 native resolution, which works better for me personally instead of the 16 by 9 as menu bars on the top can better fit without the aspect ratio of the video taking that space. The peak brightness of the screen is 400 nits and this comes with a true tone display. At certain times, I have preferred that if the screen brightness was slightly higher, uh, roughly about 600 nits as well, then it would have been better in certain conditions. This screen has P3 color gamut support, which means any Rec. 709 timeline color can easily be achieved and worked on this mostly what casual editors like me would use and be happy with or even non-pro photographers can also be satisfied with this. This screen does not support ProMotion refresh rate and has a fixed 60Hz refresh rate for the screen. Well, good enough for most daily tasks. Now talking about camera, microphone and speakers, which might just be the biggest plus points for this MacBook Air especially if you're a student buying this for long classes online. The screen has an inbuilt 720p HD camera and honestly, it is really good. Good from the previous MacBooks and way better than many laptops at the same price. This MacBook also comes with three array inbuilt microphones right below the speakers and it is pretty good. For a test, I also compared the inbuilt camera to an external 1080p camera of C615 from Logitech and you can see the difference. This is the quality of video and audio that you would get if you were using an external camera like C615 Logitech, which is a full HD camera using the inbuilt microphone from the camera itself. And this is the quality of video that you get from the inbuilt camera, which is a 720p camera into the MacBook Air and using the microphones, which are inbuilt into the computer itself. Next to the keyboard, there are stereo speakers, which do a fairly good job. These are certainly nowhere near the base promising speakers from the M1 Pro and the M1 Max laptops, but these are promising and better than many other laptops in the market for the same price. 
They have sound quality support for Dolby Atmos playback and on the loudest volume, this will be more than enough for anyone around you in a particular room to be able to listen to the music as well. Sometimes in a quieter room, I have actually edited an entire video directly using the speakers instead of using any kind of headsets. Now, as a user of this for a year, I must tell you how Instant On makes your life so much more easier and literally spoils you. As it is not only the screen that starts, but pre-connected Wi-Fi and internet is instantly available to you the moment you pull up the lid. And the best part is, this is irrespective of it being powered or unplugged. If you are in a meeting and want to quickly start a presentation to your clients, this will never disappoint you. Mostly the way that I have used this MacBook Air was with an external display. A single external display up to 6K can be attached to this machine. Downside, you are going to open yourself up to the dongle world. Speaking about which, let's talk about connectivity. One of the biggest complaints that I have on this MacBook Air. Well, there are two Thunderbolt outputs for data transfer charging and video output as well. One of the two Thunderbolt ports for me is always used for charging the MacBook with 30 watt charger which comes with a MacBook and with the second port I have left with no other choice but to invest in a dongle. This dongle life is very annoying and if Apple would have made one USB 3 port on this machine it would have made life so much more easy and I wouldn't have to use the dongle at all. So if you are someone who is constantly moving media in and out of a machine and want to connect it to a host of different devices and mostly looking to use this machine moving around and traveling, well, you might want to give it a skip as beyond a certain point, it can get very annoying to carry a dongle all the time with you. And the worst is, if you skip carrying it, you're literally stuck. It has a 3.5mm audio jack and I must say a big thank you to whoever in the design team fought to keep it on this MacBook Air. And on the wireless connectivity, the machine comes with Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5, which many people have complained about including Snazzy Labs. Well, I personally haven't found that as an issue often as I don't use Bluetooth connectivity independent devices uh, with this particular MacBook Air as I already have signed up for the dongle life. But for the ones who want to know more about this, check out this particular video from Snazzy Labs. This brings me to the performance. And I'm not going to share with you your regular benchmarks and core counts, etc. I hope you already know them. And on the other hand, benchmarks don't really do justice to what this MacBook Air can actually do for you in your real life. This M1 chip is a beast when it comes to doing everyday tasks. Surfing the internet and browsing coupled with Safari feels incredibly fast and reminds you instantly of using an iPad-like device. The inbuilt photo app is super responsive for any standard resolution of image which I have thrown at it and handles editing pictures with a breeze. Now, I don't use Lightroom and Photoshop, but the Affinity Publisher, which is now native to M1 chip, performs butter smooth for most resolutions and remember, I'm still using 8GB RAM with only 7 GPU cores. This is the bottom line of the MacBook Air configuration. At times with multiple layers and using masking features on a high-risk 6K image, I do feel that having a 16 GB RAM would have speeded up the process a little bit. But hey, the truth is, it still works without any problems or crashes. The thing which I use this MacBook Air for most is video editing for this particular channel itself using DaVinci Resolve. I was blown away after the DaVinci Resolve's native support M1 MacBook Air. It is scrubbing through 4K footage so easily that you will question if Apple has priced this MacBook less than its actual output for editing. With color correction layers and running up to even 3K 4K footage, the machine does not even blink an eye. Where I found some limitations were when fusion transitions were used, then the limited GPU and the RAM size started to show up. Personally, again, I don't let that get in the way as once my color correction is set, I drop the time resolution to half or quarter and every fusion transition then plays smoothly. So my work doesn't really suffer at all a bit even on this MacBook Air. And all of this performance is either plugged in or plugged out. 
which blows away your mind. To edit this level of video, which is 3 4K footage with some fusion transitions, you will need at least an RTX 2060 on a desktop graphics card. And a machine like that will cost you anywhere between 1 lakh rupees, without even the screen to edit on it. Speaking of graphics card, gaming on this M1 MacBook Air is like crying. Firstly, you don't have many AAA game titles, and the kind of games that you have will make you question your soul as a true gamer, like it did for me, even for this testing. So if you are a gamer and have the slightest thought of even doing casual gaming on this machine, just don't. Just don't do that to yourself. This is a productivity device, not even for casual gaming. Many applications are quickly trying to take the advantage of the M1's powerful architecture. And the ones which aren't natively using M1 are running via an emulator called Rosetta. Honestly, nothing changes for you as a user. If it is natively supported, you will get the best results of using that particular application. And if not, it will emulate and it will still work flawlessly for you. Apple has a dedicated section of apps on their App Store letting you know if these are M1 optimized or not. Another claim which Apple made while launching the M1 MacBooks was the ability to use iOS apps on MacBooks. I was super excited for it when I heard it, but in reality, I did not really use it much. There is a section available on the App Store that will tell you exactly which apps are iPad and iOS apps. Also, when you search, you will always get results of the iPad and the iOS apps along with it. But again, it is not something which in the last one year I thought of even using. Using your phone just has something more simply fluid about it which is much faster than using it over here. Maybe in future. For software developers, Xcode is natively supported and even Google has released M1 supported emulators for this particular MacBooks. There might be a few restrictions but much better than using a separate mobile device for testing altogether. Applications like Homebrew are also now natively supported for the developers on M1. Coming to battery life. This MacBook would last me for an entire edit and export of this video that speaks volume and on light browsing and video, it will easily last me for about 14 to 16 hours. Which technically means for two days of basic work, you don't even need to carry your power brick with you. Coming to costing, M1 MacBook Air will cost you about 80,000 inclusive of cashback offers going on. And for a comprehensive machine like this, it is a steal of a deal. You can think of M1 Mac Mini as well for a bit lesser, but you're losing on the quality of the screen, keyboard, touchpad, and the portability of that entire device. But if you already have all of that with you from your previous desktop machine, then the M1 Mac Mini will also be a very good deal for you. So who all should get this MacBook? And who all should actually give it a skip? Well, students for their research and assignments, agency sales and marketing people who are pitching clients, light use photographers and video editors, beginning programmers and pro audio professionals as well will really benefit from this machine because it packs in good power with portability. While professional editors and photographers who are moving data in and out several times in the day and want a primary dedicated machine with multiple ports and better GPU performance, animation professionals using large environments may want to give it a skip and instead go for the M1 Pro 14 inch which will probably add more value for their money spent. Hopefully this was helpful. As you have reached till the end, I am happy to share with you that this video marks my 20th upload on the channel and it has been an encouraging ride starting YouTube channel for my personal passion which is technology. I am trying to focus on doing quality videos. YouTube does tell me that 93.7% of people watching this haven't subscribed to the channel. But hey, I'm just happy that you're enjoying watching them. Do check out the other videos from the channel as per your interest and I will see you in the next one.